I'm Jeff Anderson, We're part of the Dynamic Learning, and we thank each of you for being here this evening. I'd like to introduce uh, Steve Roberts, his wife Suzanne, and is sitting back here in the, uh, is that turquoise, Suzanne? Uh, and they're hosting tonight. Thank you very much for hosting us, Steve. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> Jeff and Barbara have just been wonderful uh, devoting their time to have DLI have a good schedule of, of topics to cover. And we're all familiar with Lloyd and Ingrid. Uh, they they are, have been neighbors. And I've been I sat with Lloyd and Ingrid at Rotary for a good eight, ten years, and it's a, we have we've had the opportunity to make a good friendship. And Lloyd, I won't take any, any time to tell you more than he's obviously been in naval intelligence. I think there is some information that's been provided in the in the pamphlet, but he has a great story to tell, and so I'm going to turn the mic over to Lloyd. Got a treasury went into homeland. They got a lot more money, a lot more people to call on. Because what we had to do when we were in Treasury Department, the whole time I was in the Secret Service, when we needed extra people for candidate details, we had to go to Customs or to ATF, other Treasury agents, try to use them. And they would get hard stress to help us. But now with, with Homeland Security, they got tons of people to draw in for, uh, what happens is, in the Secret Service, the, the agents provide the inner perimeter and then, as you go out, another group of agents, agents that travel with the president, agents that come in, and then the police are the last. So you have uh, a lot of people involved, but actually when I always felt pretty safe on the inside because we were, we were surrounded by a lot of people. But uh, anyway, I don't think they could be doing much, much more. I, I, I don't know what they could be doing. They do an awful lot, awful lot of stuff goes on, very expensive. Bill Clinton went to Paris once and wanted to stand on the balcony of a hotel. We had to take a, about a 12 by 12 bulletproof piece of glass that was that thick with, on wheels that we couldn't roll across tile because it would crack them. We had to put carpets down. Took it up on like 12th floor, put it on his balcony so he could stand out there. He didn't go out there. <laughs> All right, that kind of stuff is very, very expensive. And they, um, as you probably have heard, the, the, Cer the Secret Service has had a lot of problems lately with, uh, I guess, morale. Morale is probably not really good because they're working so many hours and a lot of it they're not getting paid for. The, uh, what happened with, when I was in, and it ended a long time ago, we had uh, our forefathers that in, in, in the time of William McKinley when he was assassinated about 1901, 1902, we took over protection of the, of the president and the White House grounds. So as time went on, our forefathers said, hey, these people that were working for the Metropolitan Police that were used to do this had a great retirement plan. So they said, let's take it. So we did. And it is a very, it's the best retirement plan in the government. There's none like it. Of course, it's been over with now for many, many years. And what the problem with it was, it was called the Golden Handcuff Retirement Plan. You could not leave the Secret Service and take it. So attrition rate was the lowest in the government. You couldn't go anywhere, you had to stay. Also, the supervisors took advantage of that because they knew you couldn't go anywhere. So they worked you uh, to death sometimes. Uh, and that ended in 1984. So the people that had 25 years in, somewhere around 2009, most of those people were gone. So now the new people there, they can take their retirement to any government agency and move it around. So when, they, when the going gets tough, like I've told you, it can. People are just leaving. And there's no loyalty anymore. We, we had kind of a forced loyalty. Uh, the, the retirement plan was uh, ended in 84. It's what was, it is one of the best still around. So that was, uh, that attributed to the uh, low morale that we have now. Because people just get tired and they leave after all that training. Any other? In the spirit of political correctness, would they allow a Muslim to be hired? Uh, we had, uh, I'm sure they do. The, uh, when I was there, we had uh, Africans from Africa that were, that were agents. Uh, I don't think we had a problem. It's a very touchy subject. Sure. Oh, and I'll tell you about females. Why didn't somebody ask me about that? Um, 
10% of the workforce are females. Listen now, 10%. 20% of the supervisors are female. Let that sink in. So we have a lot of female bosses. And the morale is still bad? Morale is bad. <laughs> Not for them. <laughs> How many are on the presidential detail? About 300. Of the women? Oh, women. Well, I, I don't know. It's 10% of the workforce. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many. Probably, probably 20 or so. I don't know. I'm just guessing. When Clint was president, there were hundreds of women. He, had a lot of women. <laughs> he also liked some of our agents. Yeah. <laughs> so you, anyway, I'll, I'll go ahead. Did you have a favorite presidential family? Yes. Reagan's. Ronald Reagan. Reagan, by far. He was the most congenial. Uh, if you go back to the personalities, you know, Nixon was very cold and calculating. Uh, Jimmy Carter was nice, but I don't think he knew where he was much of the time. Um, Ford was obviously who he was. Uh, Clinton was a very, very nice man. <laughs> and uh, uh, the Bushes, um, okay, I guess. But Reagan is by far the best favorite. Were you involved when he got shot? No, nope, I was in Air I was in Pennsylvania Harrisburg when he got shot. No, nope, but I knew everybody there that was. Our agency was, was pretty small in those years. But I knew everybody involved, but no, I wasn't there. Another question. Yes. If the president were to come to Kerrville and you were still there and responsible for that trip, what kinds of things would you have to prepare for before he came? Oh my gosh. <laughs> It, it gets divided up into several, I mean, many, many different groups of people. You have people doing route surveys, uh, running routes, alternate routes, uh, hospitals, alternate hospitals, and not only just you're going through the hospital and checking all their, what they have and what kind of blood they have, and everything. And also, if he's staying in a hotel, it really, really gets more because then you come in, you've got elevators that have to be checked out, and uh, just about everything that you can imagine possible has to and um, I don't know how many different things, I can't even remember them all anymore, but it, it's just everything. Uh, the, uh, and of course then when you get to the event where he's going to be, you have to do the, the bomb searches, and then you gotta seal it up with agents. That's what takes a lot of our, our time. If, if he's at a big event, it might take the dogs, as you run the dogs through, it might take them hours to do that, and then you gotta seal it hours ahead of the, of, of the event. And uh, uh, let's see, command post, you have to have those set up everywhere so you have good radio communications. Would he eat the food prepared at the event? He would eat the food at the event if we have somebody watching and cooking at the event. New York usually, uh, there's White House chefs that travel with him that are, that, that are in the background with the cooks. Now when you get away from the president, vice president, Candidates, they eat the same thing we do in I. So once you get away from those two, it gets protection. You know, it goes down quite a bit as you cost. But yeah, the, uh, um, the the White House chef watches everything that's eaten. And traveling abroad, they take everything. Yeah, everything goes. Yeah. Lloyd, it's been announced that President Trump is going to the Carolinas tomorrow. Yep. How does the Secret Service plan for a trip? Two days in advance or one day in advance? <laughs> I can tell you this, they're working their hearts out. Because they are running down there, as soon as they got word of that, it may have been before we got word of it, but uh, they went, they sent teams of agents down there to start preparing. And if he just comes in and uh, makes one stop, it's not too bad, but if he goes around, then the motorcade routes have all going to be run, and you've got flooded areas, you've got all kinds of problems. But it is a horrendous amount of work. I have a friend of mine, actually it's a friend of our daughters, they're next door neighbors in DC. He's on the, he was on the detail. And he said he would, he's in he's out of the, he's in a field office now. But they're working around the clock in the field offices because they gotta support all this. So it's it's a lot of work. It's a ton of work. Do you think there's anything to the rumor that Trump's gonna have a uh, rally here to tie the stadium for Cruz? I think so. <laughs> I don't know. I'd love it if he did, but I don't think so. I don't know if he would have. Probably couldn't hold enough people. <laughs> Anybody else have any any questions at all? Really, I've got time. What kind of 
body armor did you wear? We had the Kevlar vest. And, uh, and, and when they first came out with them in the 80s, I guess, they had a small, medium, and large. You can imagine how that looked. You're so <coughs> like this, and, and uncomfortable, they're hot, but the newer ones are better. Uh, the uh, people assigned the protection are required to wear them. Now, part of it, a good part of the, uh, maybe 50-50, of the work is not protection work, it's investigating the threats of the president, and if you have time, counterfeiting of currency or whatever else might be going on with the financial crimes. But uh, yeah, they're required to wear them. And uh, even the, uh, the president has bulletproof overcoats. Sometimes you'll see him wearing it. Sometimes he looks pretty bulky. It's probably because he's got bulletproof vests on. But if you get a headshot, they don't have much good. You know, they have a, uh, they showed some photos of a Secret Service with a fake arm. Is that they said they had their hand. I saw that. I saw that. Was there anything hey, to it? I, I've never seen that, but that's a, that's a good idea. <laughs> but uh, if, you, if you're looking for agents when you're on television and you see the president, you'll see all the agents standing like this. That's what they're taught now. So if you see people standing around, they're agents like this with suits, suits on. So they can get to their gun real quick. That's the idea behind it. So just start watching for that. You'll laugh. <laughs> Did you get a fair amount of weapons training? Oh, yeah, I was a range master for a long time. And uh, back then we had a, we carried a 357 Magnum, uh, Smith & Wesson, Smith and & Wesson, and then the Uzi submachine gun, and the, uh, the Remington shotgun, which I really loved. You couldn't miss with a shotgun if you are nervous. You just shoot. Um, somebody asked President Trump to reopen the investigation on the Lindsay Graham case. No, I have not heard of that at all. Absolutely. Say the question, question again. Um, somebody had asked President Trump to reopen the investigation on the liberty. Somebody who had served. Okay. I don't remember. I, I did. I, I, I'm not aware of it, but we've asked every president since okay. J, uh, LBJ going way back. But, you know, they don't seem to want to do that. So that who killed Kennedy? Pardon me? Who killed John? <laughs> probably not who you're told. I don't know, but uh, like you, I probably, I'm judging from your question. You have, you don't quite probably believe what you were told, and I'm, and I'm not sure I do either. But uh, when we were hired, we had to read the Warren report, and basically it's the standard stuff you see. And then before Warren died, he said it was it was not true. It was fabricated. And I'm, okay, that was good. <laughs> Um, earlier on, we talked about having to, um, there was a, someone that you were watching over that had to take a plane, and then, but you had to, your, your detail had to go. John to Schmitz, park. yeah. Yes, and so at that time, you have a, you have a bubble on your car, too? Yeah, yeah, we did. Okay. Wait, I got one at home, I stole one, I have one now. The old fashioned, back. Michael Kojak, you know, used to put his thing on his top of the Yeah, we had those. <laughs> yeah, we did. And now that the cars have them, you know, they're in the grills and everything, you don't see them. Oh. But yeah, we did. We did. And uh, the uh, Highway Patrol State Troopers were always very nice to us. Angela, they were very nice to us. Her husband's a state trooper. <laughs> so we, we spent a lot and we didn't get in trouble. But yeah. Was the family allowed to say that? You were a part of Secret Service, or did they have to have a cover story? No, you know, they, they could say, uh, although I, I was, uh, my ID, my California driver's license said Lloyd D. Artist, because my name is Painter, Artist Painter. Oh, wow. And, uh, but that's, that's what we use when we, when, you know, if somebody were around saw our driver's license. But, uh, yeah, the families could say that wasn't a big issue. I, I don't think anyway. Ingrid didn't have any protection in the baby. <laughs> <laughs> she should have. And we lived, uh, we lived in, uh, we started in Sacramento, went to Westminster, California, went to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, actually, Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, Centerville, Virginia, which is Washington, D.C., back out to San Francisco, lived in Fairfield, California. So we were all over the place, moving. Yes, sir. Do your do your neighbors know what you do, or do you 
have some other? Probably not so much. I didn't. It's kind of funny because when we worked, we didn't talk to neighbors very much. Basically, you know, it, it's kind of a strange thing because I, I had nothing in common with most people that worked in average jobs. I just didn't. And, and we had a, a pretty good group of people in the service that we, you know, we had socialized with, but um, I don't think the neighbors really knew too much, didn't say much. Oh yeah, the, uh, you were asked about the Liber USS Liberty earlier. There's been several television uh, specials done on that, and one of them, uh, all of them I was in, but I was interviewing a uh, real crazy person that we had to keep an eye on, and <coughs> I never told him my real name or anything, obviously. And one day I saw him and he said, you're Mr. Painter. Holy cow, how do you know that? He said, I saw you on television. So he had seen the, the uh, special on the USS Liberty and remembered it. He, he was really a crazy, crazy person. We had a lot of crazies. In fact, in, uh, in, in uh, Denver, one of my classmates, this was back in the 80s, was sitting in the office and a crazy came in and just shot him, killed him. So uh, after that, we had a little bit of blast in our offices. And, yeah, they, uh, we attracted crazy people. And when you threaten the president, generally speaking, you're, most of them were mentally imbalanced. And we had to commit them into uh, the cities, but probably 80%, 75% of my job was, was threats on the president. And I can't imagine what they're going through now. I can't imagine. I see threats on television. Right. Yeah. Is, is there an office in San Antonio that you can work? Yes. And there's an office in Austin. No. Not here. Right. This, is, this is coming out of San Antonio. I mean, there are several in Texas. Yeah, this, this, this area is under the uh, jurisdiction of San Antonio. Pretty big office. Well, medium sized office. Yes, Lori. Is there any chance of your being called back if there's any. Uh, not out of my age, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. They really, they'd really be in trouble. But to, to back it up a little bit, um, in years past, they have called people up to work. Uh, not in recent years, they still right now use retired agents to do background investigations for, for hiring new people. They do that. But uh, there was one there was one occasion when they, they thought about doing that, they were so short-handed. But they never actually uh, went through with that, I don't think. But you know, I, at my age, I couldn't do much. I'd throw a gun out of me. <laughs> Lloyd uh, Ingrid, thank you so much. Thank you. Original concept on the head, face, neck, hand, or fingers. Nothing below the wrist bone. So I, I met all those qualifications, but the qualifications were a little bit less than. Probably wouldn't have made it today. But anyway, the uh, the job training that is a seventeen, I uh, rather twenty-seven week course. Ten weeks basic criminal investigation school uh, includes investigation techniques, interview techniques, federal criminal, and that's in Lenko, Georgia. And from there, you go to 17 more weeks in Washington, D.C., at Beltsville, Maryland. And in Beltsville, Maryland, the Secret Service has built, like a movie set, a city. Hotels, restaurants, everything. And they have uh, interactive uh, range. You walk down the street, people jump up, shoot at you, and all this kind of stuff. And that the president, obviously, helicopters in, not the president, one of our agents. The helicopters in, it's, it's live. I mean, it really is something to see. It's a unique experience to go on that set and look around because it's an eerie feeling that um, everything there is, is just a facade. It, there's not anything behind it, but it just gives you, actually have a hotel that you go into that they built. But it's all for training purposes. And the training is very, very extensive and very, uh, I guess it's very hard, I remember that. I, that's what I do remember. And uh, anyway, before we start with what I did, the, uh, we'll go back to Sacramento in a minute. But I wanna tell you about the presidents and vice presidents that I served under. When I was hired, uh, Richard Nixon and was president, Spiro Agnew, Gerald Ford were uh, vice presidents. Then we had Gerald Ford and Nelson Rockefeller 
Then we had Jimmy Carter and Walter Mondale. We had Ronald Reagan and George Bush. We had George Bush, Dan Quayle, Bill Clinton, and Al Gore. And at different times, I worked with all these people. <clears throat> now we'll go to Sacramento. Because in, uh, in 1970, we were hired, and at that particular moment in time, there were a lot of demonstrations in this country over Vietnam, and, and protecting people was a real, real issue. So what they did to us is they, we remember I said there were two schools, one for investigation, one for protection. They decided right then to heck with the, protect, the investigation. They sent us to Washington, D.C. for just the protection part of the program. And I was in the Secret Service probably just out of school, maybe six weeks, and I found myself standing on a, on a stage next to President Nixon. And I thought back of the, the helicopters out in, the, in California in those days. But the thing with it was, I, you know, the, the crowds were rowdy, they were protesting, they were angry about Vietnam mainly. And uh, I, I looked over at the president who was standing there talking, and I thought, God, I wonder if he's as, as afraid as I am. This, this what's going on here tonight? <laughs> but anyway, the, uh, after, after the Nixon assignment, I got sent back to Sacramento. And uh, Ingrid and I were talking about this the other day, because she brought up a couple things and I forgot. Actually, I was assigned at one time. Let me just a little bit back up. When we started protecting uh, candidates, we didn't have any real rules. Anybody that ran, we protected. We got that, got that ironed out a few years later, but this was the first time we did it after Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. So I got assigned to Dr. Benjamin Spock, <laughs> who, was, who was part of the People's Party. And I remember driving him around. Nobody really knew who he was. And he just had a big bottle of vodka in the back seat and just drank the whole time. I remember old doctor. And then we had another one. You might remember John Schmitz, who was an American Independent Party. He flew around in a Cessna and had about three seats in it. And we drove in cars. And we would race him around California to one landing spot to the next. And be there when he got there. He could. So, I mean, it, it was... Uh, it was a learning experience for all of us back in those early days. <laughs> then uh, after, after the, uh, uh, the Schmitz and the Benjamin Spocks, I got, I got, tra I got uh, put on George Corley Wallace's detail, a segregationist who ran for president. He carried five or six states. He was very popular and also very unpopular. And uh, we were... Uh, besieged at, at, at events because then we were just into this stuff, into this part of our history of protecting candidates. And it was very difficult. I mean, they, we didn't have the manpower. And so uh, the crowds with George Wallace would get, uh, get pretty active. I remember one time in Fort Wayne, Indiana, they, they came at us. And I remember falling down, grabbing my gun and radio and going down. They came over the top. We got him out the back. And they bricked his limo as he left. And it was, uh, it was a different time. It was much more violent, I think. Than, you know, we think it's bad now, but I think it was much worse then. So the George Wallace detail, I don't know if you remember, he got shot in Laurel, Maryland. He got shot in the back. I was doing leapfrogging. It was like he would be in comfort, come to Kerrville, go to Ingram. And we were leapfrogging ahead like that. And I was one stop ahead of him when he got shot. But then we went to, to Bethesda Naval Hospital with him and stayed, I think, about three months. We, we protected him in the hospital. That was, I was away from home, I think, four months. I left in the spring, came back almost in the fall. And uh, there were, they were bad times. The service wasn't budgeted for all this. They forced us into having two to a room. They'd run a midnight shift and a day shift and one hotel room. And you can imagine, and you didn't know who your roommates were. These were, these were, you know, these were teenagers. Anyway, these were middle-aged men, and, and they, oh my gosh, it was just tough. But uh, we stayed with him through that, and he, he wanted to go to the convention after he was in a wheelchair and recovered enough. We took him to the convention in Miami, and he made an appearance. It was a very cheerful thing for many people because he was he was really gravely injured. And <clears throat> When we were there, one of his friends was Marty Robbins. You might remember Marty Robbins. 
but he would come in and sit down and, talk, and play for us. Kept, kept everybody happy enough. And those were just different times. I don't, we couldn't repeat that today, I don't think. But it was, it was neat. Then from Sacramento, I got transferred to Los, to, uh, Los Angeles. Big field office there. Sacramento was small, and Los Angeles was very large. And uh, I remember some of the events there that were very interesting to me. Spiro Agnew was the vice president, and he was being investigated for bribery and all kinds of other things. But he hadn't been forced out of office at that point. And we went to a convention center in Los Angeles for the National Organization of Women. And he told a story about how he was being persecuted, and let, literally half the women were crying. And the next day he resigned, because he was guilty of all those things that they said he was guilty of. I thought, wow, what a politician. You know? I couldn't have done that. And uh, then, of course, came along after uh, you know, we, we got Vice President Ford, kind of by default, I guess. But he was a, uh, he was a nice enough fellow, but extremely boring. <laughs> we had to listen to his speeches night, three times a day, four times sometimes. Morning, brunch, lunch, dinner, whatever. And uh, he used to make jokes because he told he told he told the same joke every just everything was written down, just repeated. And he said that he knew that many of the Secret Service agents wanted to streak out. If you remember what that was, run out with no clothes on. If he said these jokes one more time, which I thought at least he knew we were bored. <laughs> And he, we didn't have any protests with Gerald Ford. He was, he was quiet. And uh, then uh, Ronald Reagan ran for office, and I got assigned to his detail for about eight months and got to know the Reagan family really, really well. Probably some of the, the best times I had because he was a candidate then in 76. And, with, and when you're a candidate, you don't have staff like you do when you're president. And he would actually come out, sit down, talk to us, and tell jokes in our command post. Really a nice fellow, and Nancy was a great person. And uh, we would go up to the ranch with him, and uh, it's quite an ordeal to take an armored limo up a seven, eight thousand foot mountain that goes straight up. Because every time we brought it down, we wore out the brakes. We I mean, literally wore them out and put new brakes on it. And they'd start smoking on the way down because of the weight. <clears throat> he uh, <clears throat> he started a movie. Reagan had started a movie. The Secret Service story, I think, back in 39 or 1939, a long time ago. And uh, he was so proud of that because he would talk to us about that joke and, and uh, said that was really one of his favorite movies. And he really liked us, and we liked him. He kept the pillow under his gun, under his, uh, he kept the gun under his pillow, pistol. And one night the alarms went off, and uh, when we got inside, he had his gun already out, and it, it, the alarm had gone off by mistake. And, uh, he, uh, he said, if you hadn't gotten them, I would <laughs> But uh, the, uh, the ranch is beautiful. Amber's been up there several times. It's uh, a quaint house up on the top of a mountain, built somewhere around 1900. It's an adobe hut, basically. And that's where he spent his time. He actually had the queen up there. Queen Elizabeth came and went up to that place. I mean, it was really, really sparkling. But he loved it. And uh, we took up a collection when he was running and bought him a silver belt buckle. It was very expensive, I can remember back then. We only had about 20 people kicking in money. And it was a belt buckle with his code word on it. His code word was rawhide. And he wore that through that period of time. And then when he was president for eight years, he wore it. He always wore that. He loved it. And uh, later, too, uh, the, uh, I guess some of the funny things, I can take some funny things. I, I, I won't get political because that's not fair. Um, the, uh, a lot of the foreign dignitaries, when we protect foreign dignitaries that come to the United States, uh, heads of state, heads of government that come in, we protect them also. And so we have a lot of foreign dignitaries, especially from the African countries. And when they came, they brought their entire government because they didn't want a coup back home. Everybody. And they brought their gold, usually, in big boxes. And so we would take them to Disneyland, and the pirates of the Caribbean, they would, they would actually pee their pants. And we'd have to take them back into the hotel. And you know, those are just funny things I remember that happened. And the, uh, one of the other things was the, the, 
king of Tonga, being the head of state, head of government, he got protection. He weighed 550 pounds. And when he came into the United States, he came into American Samoa. So I've, been, I've had to go there several times to Samoa, to American Samoa, to pick him up to bring him. Well, the Americana Hotel there is like a Motel 6. And that's the only thing there is. And uh, they wouldn't allow him to come after the, second, after the first time he visited. Because when he sat on their toilets, he broke them. <laughs> and getting a toilet in the middle of the Pacific Ocean is not easy. So they, we said, well, he has to come here. You know, where, where's he going to stay? So we devised a platform for him to sit on with a hole in the top. <laughs> Literally. So he could sit there and not crush the toilets. <laughs> the same, same person, when we got him into Hawaii, they wanted to have a luau in the Alamoana Hotel on the eighth floor. They allowed it, open fire on the eighth floor, and they roasted the pig. I can still, these are some of the things I can remember happening. I doubt whether it happened today. Fire marshals may not be happy about that. But the, um, from after uh, four years in LA, I got transferred to Mamie Eisenhower's detail in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And if you, did any of you see Guarding Test, the movie? That's Mamie Eisenhower. It's kind of a compilation of Mamie and uh, uh, another first lady, I can't remember her name, but it was, it was a mixture, Beth Truman and, and Mamie put together, and that was the movie. But she was the wife of a president, obviously, a former president, and she was the wife, a former wife, a wife of a former five-star general. She had more clout than anybody in the United States. And when we would take her places, especially, she st especially when we traveled with her, she always went by car. So we would drive from Pennsylvania, Gettysburg, Florida, and on the way there, we'd stop at a military base, and she would just pull in, and she would say, I want the general's quarters. And they would say, whoa, we got a general in there. And she said, get him out. <laughs> we'd go there and watch a general and his wife and kids pack out and leave. <laughs> but uh, she was a very powerful woman and, and very set in her ways, but uh, a lot of power in one lady. She called the president in a minute if she didn't like it. That's the way it was. And uh, sometimes she did, not on me, but... <laughs> then uh, from there we went to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, to the uh, field office there. And it was a time when Jimmy Carter was president and he loved to fish. Unfortunately, he found a fishing hole in my district. <laughs> and it was in State College, Pennsylvania. It was like three hours from where I lived. And back then, if you all remember the gas lines, well, we, we fell into the same problem. We had, we had trouble getting gas for our cars. And so every time, and every, it came almost every other weekend, and we had to drive up there begging gas from the post office, and anywhere we could get gas to go up there. And he would come out, helicopters would, and all this, you know, there's no gas for the cars, but the helicopters had fuel. And one of the trips, he looked down, he saw gas lines, and he asked an agent, not a staff person, he asked an agent, what is that? And they said, those are gas lines, Mr. President. And he said, well, how come we got gas lines? He did not know. That's how isolated they can become in their little lagoon. So uh, the Carter fishing trips were, were something, I, I worked a lot of Jimmy Carter in those days. He also decided to go to Three Mile Island. Do you all remember that? Mm -hmm. The meltdown? Well, we lived about 20 miles from that. And uh, I was scared to death of radiation and you know, we were all really fearful. Well, Jimmy wanted to come out and go through the plan, or the, the meltdown plan. And I thought, oh my gosh, I have to, my district, I gotta go out there and do advance work and all that. So Jimmy came and I was headed out to, to do my work and somebody threatened, the president, threatened his life in Harrisburg, which is 20, 30 miles away. I said, I'll do that one. Yeah. And, I, and I, it was the longest interview I ever did in my life. <laughs> Because when I got through interview, Jimmy Carter was gone. <laughs> and I didn't go into Three Mile Island. So I, that was one of the things, that was my, one of my achieve, achievements, I think. <laughs> didn't go. But in, uh, in Harrisburg, when we were there, the Secret Service, as, you, as I said, is not very large. And we had a two-man office, and we covered 90-some counties. So you were always on the road, and you were very close to Washington. So when somebody threatened the president, you had to go. I remember back in those years we had pagers and I wore it around my neck when I moved my lawn. 
because that was just that much. If, you, if they got a threat, you had to go then. You couldn't go tomorrow or the next day or whatever, you went then. And uh, some, of, some of our trips were two or three hours one way to find somebody that made a threat on the president's life. The, uh, <clears throat> one, of the, one, of the, one of the unusual things I always think about when I think about Jimmy Carter was he liked to go to Penn State games in, in State College, Pennsylvania. And so on one of the games, the Nittany Lion, the Nittany Lion is some kid that dresses up like a lion and jumps around. But he was, had a criminal record, and we threw him off the field. And uh, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Carter and the crew, then, what's going on? You know, anybody who has a criminal record can't be in those kind of, near the president. So we removed him from his job as a Nittany Lion. Was <laughs> anyway. <laughs> the, uh, the other thing that, that Jimmy, and that I did with Jimmy Carter, everybody called him Jimmy Carter, Jimmy. He was really a nice guy, and not, not, didn't know much about people, but not a bad person. His daughter, Amy, was, uh, went to tennis camp in my district. So, a couple of summers, I would sit there and watch the tennis ball go back. <laughs> 10 hours, you know, 12 hour shifts. And what she liked to do was try to sneak out of the dorm at night, because we, we surround the dorm. And she was fond of trying to get away and run away and get away from the Secret Service. Well, that wouldn't look too good for a Secret Service agent to lose the first daughter. So we had, she was a real pain in the you know what. As were most of the Carter's kids. But anyway, that's a different story. But anyway, she was, she was a little then, didn't know much different, I guess. <clears throat> one of the things that Ingrid brought up that I'd forgotten about, uh, one of the campaigns, I think it was in 1980, I was assigned to a congressman by the name of Phil Crane. And uh, he was one of the, he's, he's died now, but he was a congressman for like 20, 30 years, maybe 30 years, out of Illinois. And he ran for president, obviously he didn't get it, but he was one of the nicest gentlemen that I think we ever ran across. And when we finished with him, when he, when he dropped out of the race, he rented a room in one of the Senate office buildings and threw a big party for the Secret Service agents and their wives, food, everything. Just a real, real nice person. And uh, I just looked it up recently, I thought he, and he died about 10 years ago, but he was, he, was, he was a gentleman. Some of the things you remember that happened in your lifetime. From uh, Harrisburg, we went to Washington, D.C. Ronald Reagan was president, and uh, I was assigned to our headquarters uh, division in Washington, D.C., which is, is supposedly a very, very good place to get to be because, as you know, everything happens near the flagpole. So anyway, we ended up there, and I ended up in, a, uh, in an office where we were computerizing all of our criminal records. And I worked on that for a couple of years. Um, not something I liked, but I did. But in the meantime, during that time, we get assignments out. And uh, one of the assignments that I had was with Ronald Reagan and his inaugural inauguration. I worked about 20 hours, and we started uh, like four in the morning and worked till all the way through the balls the next night and everything. Just bitter cold, it was minus 20 degrees, and it was very, very rough. And uh, one of the trips with Reagan, we went to, some of the countries don't allow us to carry weapons, Japan being one of them, usually the Commonwealth countries, or former Commonwealth, or Commonwealth leaning countries. So what we would do is we would uh, put our weapons in the diplomatic pouch, send it in and get it from the embassy and get our guns. Well, we were told if you get caught with a gun, you're on your own. And here's a country that didn't allow us to have guns and we were running around with guns. But anyway, I'd be very careful not to get in any trouble over there. So th those are some of the things that I remember that, of, of all these years later. Um, we ended up, one of the stops we made was in South Korea. And I remember the airport was like 20 miles from the hotel, and they had lined up little Korean kids, like grammar school kids, waving American flags, all the way through, all the way through the whole process. I thought, wow, well, you know, we could never do that at home. We'd never be able to pull that one off. But, uh, and then uh, on that stop too, we went to Singapore, and we were given these huge, long, long briefing about what not to do there. Don't spit, don't cuss, don't, you know, all this stuff because they don't do any of that. Well, as soon as the sun went down, the prostitutes came out, the, the Rolex, fake Rolex watchers came out, and 
you know, it was just all a big show because actually they did what they wanted to do when the sun went down. But, uh, <laughs> and also during that time, Ingrid had lunch with Barbara Bush, who was uh, the vice president's wife at that time. That was an interesting thing at the, uh, the uh, vice president's mansion, the old observatory. Then we moved to San Francisco. And I spent a lot of time in San Francisco. When I first got there, I got assigned, and this was a, this was a real big assignment. I was a, a site agent for the Pope's visit to Carmel, California. And I spent six months to seven months working with the Catholic Church for this visit. <coughs> and it was really, really intense. The protection was, was off the charts. And uh, one of the things that we had done for his arrival, we had uh, tents, and pipe and grapes, they call it, covered areas so he could get out of the vehicle and nobody could get a shot at it, basically what they're doing. So anyway, we're there, the wind blew up as it does in Carmel a lot, and just ripped that thing like a kite right out of the ground, blew it away. And I said, holy crap. I hope there's nobody around looking, you know, the guns were dead, you know. But anyway, that, that came and went. Avery got to meet the Pope. That was probably one of the highlights of her life, mine too. But uh, anyway, the, uh, uh, <laughs> the next thing I did was a round the world trip with Dan Quayle. <laughs> we uh, checked our weapons. No weapons. Think about this, no weapons. We checked them at Andrews Air Force Base and went on around the world. And uh, we, one, of the, one of the neat places we visited was Australia. We went out to Great Barrier Reef, snorkeled. All, I couldn't believe I was getting paid for all this. Mm -hmm. But uh, we had no weapons and uh, we were just there for show. So it was, it was really, a, really a neat trip, unusual trip. And at that time we got refueled in the air. I never had that happen. When, when another plane gets right above you and they refuel, there's a lot of shaking and all this going on. And it, was, it was quite interesting. And by the way, when we're talking about this, uh, when the, the president travels, you know, his whole motorcade, everything gets flown by. I think there they used to be C5s, they're usually some other aircraft now. The whole motorcade gets, gets, gets taken. And the president takes all of his food and all of his electricity, all of his communications, everything. He doesn't rely on any, anything out of the country. So we, when we were refueling, we had, we had cars in the plane. Because I was in the car plane at the time. They, they had a lot of planes. And I was in the car plane where they put a lot of agents because it's basic military flight. You know, when they throw a little sandwich at you. Um, oh, and on the way back with, with uh, Dan Quayle, we stopped at the Valdez oil spill. And we flew into Anchorage and choppered out uh, by Coast Guard to the Valdez oil spill. The USS Juno was stationed out there, an old aircraft carrier, helicopter uh, ship. And we landed on it, landed on the, on the ship with a helicopter and spent an afternoon there going through the oil spill. And uh, the massive amount of energy that was put, the money that was put in that spill cleanup was unbelievable. But anyway, um, let me see here what we got next. One of the things too, it was kind of interesting when George Bush, uh, <coughs> was president, the father, his son, uh, George, later to be president, uh, had of course protection and he was a part owner of the Texas Rangers. <coughs> and uh, we would get to go to the games and meet Nolan Ryan and all kinds of fun stuff. But uh, going back to San Francisco, I got cross-trained in what is known as technical security. And that was a job I did every election year I ran the dogs and the magnetometers and did building surveys. And uh, all the mag everybody that goes inside where the president is today, it, as it was then, goes through a magnetometer. And you have, in a, in a magnetometer, you can do 800 people an hour. That's with, when it's not raining and there's not umbrellas and everything else. So you figure 800 an hour and one. And just think of when, when uh, our president's drawing 20, 30,000 people the number of magnetometers that you have to fly in. They're flown in uh, by military aircraft. They have teams of, of uniform division people that work those magnetometers, and I was, I was in charge of them. It was very, very interesting. That part of the job I really liked. Um, also, at the very end of my career, I became a regional recruiter. I recruited for the Secret Service. And uh, I assisted in, well, 
in interviewing and then testing and also assisting the polygraph operators. And we had, I think around 70% of the people failed the polygraph. It was, it was, it was bad. And we would have all kinds of things. Uh, I always tell this story, and you're my cringe. But one of the uh, young young men we had was from Berkeley, out of Berkeley, UC Berkeley, strong guy and everything. But when he got to the polygraph, he was taking the polygraph. The polygraph operator ran up to me and said, "You know, we got a problem with this guy. What is it?" I said, "Bestiality." I said, "Oh, no! This young guy that was had, had having sex with animals, I guess." But it came out polygraph. Uh, holy cow! We, we didn't we didn't hire. Him. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> okay, we'll talk about some general Secret Service information now. Um, I said earlier we have 32 agents, about the size of the Dallas Police Department. The Uniform Division has about 1,300. Uniform Division is basically in and around Washington D.C. The embassies, the, the White House. And uh, we have 116 offices in the United States and 20 overseas. That's with 3,200 agents. So you can see not many of those offices are real large. Some of them are two man, some maybe one. And uh, the salary ranges from 130 to 171. And the weapons now are the 6RP 229 and the FN P90 submachine gun and a Remington 870 shotgun. That was always my favorite. I'm going to read you some of the things that I, I have copied of what agents have said and some of their statements about the Secret Service. It kind of gives you an idea. One of the general information things is, says the Secret Service recruits widely, though it doesn't hire many people. Those who make it past the battery of mental, physical, and psychological tests must then face a grueling pipeline of training centers that will leave them physically battered and and ever in danger of washing out. The agency wants the best of the best. According to a grim joke among training instructors, because as they say, we're just one assassination away from wearing an FBI badge. <laughs> when, when, when I worked, the whole period of time, I'm not sure it happened today because of what's going on, but the FBI always wanted protection of the president. And they were always after our little agency. But if you think about it, probably it's such a good thing to have a massive event. We had 3,200, they probably got 40,000 agents. Mm -hmm. So we were always the envy of them. They were always trying to get our, our jurisdiction. It goes on to say, if you graduate from Secret Service recruit training, expect your personal life to suffer. <clears throat> In terms of the actual physical experience, imagine something like this. Forego sleep for 24 hours, skip lunch and dinner, stand outside of a house in the rain at 3 a.m. for several hours, then take a cab to the airport, and finally board a plane to a large city for a four-hour flight. Repeat this regime for several days in a row. To make the simulation complete, you also need to fail to attend a child's birthday or graduation, and miss the holidays or your wedding anniversary. And that is a fact. When I worked, we never planned anything. You could plan your annual leave six months in advance. You could be pretty good about that. But you could not plan a barbecue next Saturday night. You didn't know if you are going to be here or not phone call would come in and you'd be gone. And still this very day, Ingrid laughs about it, but I still have a suitcase packed with everything except clothes. I just throw in and I can go, because that's how I live. And I can remember being in the airports around the holidays and people would be going with their families on holiday and stuff and I'd be drudging along with my, going somewhere to work. So it was, it was a, a very tense job and you, you kept busy all the time. And, and really ended up raising our daughter because I was gone most of the time. I, I was just gone. Here's, here's some numbers. In fiscal year 2016, 27,000 potential candidates applied for Secret Service jobs. 300 were selected. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's hard to get in. And it, it goes on to say that for many of them, failing was due to drugs and the abuse of drugs mostly prescription drugs that have emerged in recent, recent years. I, like I mentioned earlier, the, uh, our training facility is in Beltsville, Maryland. It's a mock-up of a city. Uh, they'll helicopter in somebody pretending to be the president and protecting you, getting motorcades and, 
It's quite a, it's quite a extensive. They've since, since I was in, they built a White House, a big mock-up of the White House, which is quite interesting. But it's all done outside the view of the public. It's hit, it's hidden in the beautiful area around Beltsville, Beltsville Maryland, with church, really thick trees, so you can't see much. And it's very, very neat training center. Very, very first class. All right, what do I got here? I'll talk about the limo for a minute. It's kind of an interesting thing. <clears throat> the president's limo, the one he has now, is a 2009. <clears throat> Excuse me. It isn't actually a Cadillac. It looks like one, but it's not. Unlike any presidential uh, limo before, the beast, they call it the beast shares little in common with the standard production car. Its chassis, diesel engine, and transmission are based on those used in the Kodiak, a rugged commercial vehicle previously sold as everything from a dump truck to a U-Haul. Um, it has its own airplane. It's flown by a C-17 Globemaster everywhere it goes. It and the other uh, follow-up cars, all the armor-plated cars are all flown. And it's calling it an, un, an armored car is an understatement. There's probably not a better armored vehicle with windows on the planet than the Beast. The armor plating is said to be eight inches thick and its doors weigh as much as those of a Boeing 757 aircraft, about 350 pounds per doors. Five inch thick, bullet, five inch thick bulletproof windows. <clears throat> Let me see here what else. Um, Gigantic, nearly bus-sized Goodyear tires are Kevlar-reinforced, run-flat tires capable of keeping the beast on the road for quite some distance if needed. The interior is sealed off from the outside world to reduce risk of a chemical attack with a special foam surrounding the fuel tank to insulate it in the event of an impact. It's exceedingly well-equipped. There are tear gas canisters, shotguns, grenade launchers integrated into the, in, integrated into the beast. Secret Service has learned a lot since JFK, Open Top Continental. It holds seven passengers. We have about three or four or five, they don't, the, the number of them, they keep pretty quiet. But there, there's more than one presidential limo because when he's leapfrogging, they have to have more as you go. It runs on diesel. And it says that it will not go, it weighs 20,000 pounds probably five, four or five times the size of a car. And it will go only about 60 miles an hour because of that heaviness. And it gets eight miles, up to eight miles per gallon. <laughs> so, and, it, and they're talking about getting a new one uh, this next year, so they may have a new one on the, on the chopping block now that I'm not aware of. Air Force One is a modified Boeing 747. Uh, the trips can be very long. It has two fully equipped galleys that feed up to 100 people at a time. It has a storage area for 2,000 meals. It's an onboard medical facility with staff doctor, extensive pharmacy, operating table, retractable stairways so no airport equipment is needed, its own baggage loader, extensive electronics, 85 telephones, fax machines, 19 televisions, 238 miles of wiring, twice that of a 747 commercial. Heavy shielding, electromagnetic pulse, nuclear blast. <clears throat> it's, it's safe from that to some extent. In-flight refueling step indefinitely. Designed to withstand air attack, military plane. Electronic countermeasures, jam enemy radar. Eject flares to throw off heat-seeking missiles. That is basically it, except I'll tell you who I've met during my course, which I found a non-politician. Non I met John Wayne. <laughs> which I thought was the coolest thing ever. He was, uh, it was at the time when Nixon was in so much trouble with the 18 minute tape or whatever he had. And uh, we were walking to his room, it's quite a long walk. And we were walking along and the Secretary of Treasury was with him at the time, Bill Simon, he was about this tall, John Wayne was up here. And, and, and John, and uh, they were talking about Nixon and his problems. And uh, John Wayne looked down and said, he should have burned up son of a bitches. <laughs> Simon, yeah, yeah, he should have, he should have. <laughs> but anyway, and also I met Bob Hope. Uh, he was probably in his 70s at the time. He looked like he was 30. 
It was unbelievable. It looked very, very good. Clint Eastwood. Uh, Clint Eastwood. A story about Clint Eastwood. When we did the, the Carmel Pope visit, of course, he lives in Carmel. And he was there a lot. And the mission itself was being overrun by a group of people developing condoms right next to it. They wanted to, if you've ever been out to Carmel, it's gorgeous. But anyway, they wanted to put a condo complex right next to it. So Clint Eastwood bought the land for several million and gave it to him. Gave it to the church. He said, here, nobody's going to build next to you, which I thought was my thing. <laughs> and then, of course, John Paul II, the Pope, Kirk Douglas, Wayne Newton, Marty Robbins, Cheryl Ladd, Barbara Mandel, many, many others that I've probably forgotten about. But it was an interesting career. It never really seemed like a job, although it probably seemed like a very, very hard job to Ingrid, who stayed back. And uh, anyway, that's basically it. I'm open to questions now for whatever you need, whatever you want. Yeah, I want to hear from Ingrid. All right. <laughs> yeah, do it, do it. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, just, just stand up and talk. Tell, yeah. tell about it. The most interesting thing was when uh, we, the, uh, the ones of the Secret Service agents, were invited to Barbara Bush uh, luncheon. And uh, it was just unbelievable because there were Navy, you know, uniformed people everywhere, and they were just catering to a girl, and it was just one of the nicest and extraordinary things I've ever seen. And so, what a, was he able to tell you much about what he was doing? <laughs> no, not really, no. That kind of pretty much kept secrets, and so we, we were not allowed to know anything. And, uh, but the, end, the real difficult thing was that he was gone. A lot. And uh, you know, when you have a child, <laughs> especially a girl, it's not that easy. <laughs> Just uh, you know, growing up without a father, because it's basically what it was. You know, that I had to take care of all the responsibilities around the homes, and uh, so that was that was not not very easy. Any other questions? How great I am? <laughs> yeah, I had a question. You were talking about the magnometers or whatever you called it. Is that, were you ever able to, or any of your team, avoid an incident that you know of by using those? Well, we kept out any weapons, and that would be that. That would happen a lot. People would have actually, you know, a firearm permit. You can't go in. Okay. My question was, what is a magnet? A metal detector yeah, yes. at the airport. Yeah. Like, yeah. The airport. So close <laughs> calls. Would you, would you consider you ever had close calls? You know, I, I look back on everything. Probably there were close calls that I never knew about. I think back in the, in the time of George Wallace when we had all those problems. Probably, and another reason too is the Secret Service hadn't really got its act together when it came to candidates. It was all learning. And I think we were probably. Uh, susceptible to a lot of things we didn't know, and we often said, and don't ever repeat this, that there's a lot of smoke and mirrors with the Secret Service. The people think we do are doing a lot more than we're doing, but we do a lot. And uh, the uh, when you when you protect when the protection of the president takes about 10 percent of the agent force. That's about 300 people. Mm. So and you know when you go to the vice president, it drops off drastically, and the former president way down. So with the president, he's very, very safe. Very safe. Uh, safe as it can be. And uh, the, uh, the further down you go into the candidates and stuff, there, there's just not the manpower usually to, to do it. But I don't know whether I came close to anything or not. I know um, we hope we did. We hope we, we, hope we stopped a lot. So I'll grab it. Why can't you tell us about it, please? About the Clintons? Uh -huh. <laughs> I'll say this much. Bill Clinton is a charismatic person. And because of that, he got away with a whole lot of things. <laughs> but the, the, he was, uh, I didn't, we didn't have any problem with him. He was just one of these uh, very, very nice, congenial men who everybody liked. 
And I think that saved him from a lot of problems that he had in other parts of his life. What about his lovely wife? <laughs> Those are hard questions there. Well, oh, she's not running for anything. Um, or she's not now. Um, gosh, how can I say something nice? <laughs> I can't say anything nice. <laughs> Lloyd, what's your opinion of the Secret Service providing lifetime protection for retired presidents and their families? Um, I think it probably is necessary. It's something if you, a former president, they kidnapped him uh, in today's world with the, with the terrorists running around and held him for ransom or whatever. I, I think it's probably necessary. They, they stopped it, you know, for a while. Uh, George Bush, the junior, stopped it for, and uh, changed it to 12 years after office. When uh, Barack Obama came in, he said, I want this for life. So they changed it back to life. So now they get it for life. Um, Again, they always have. But I think, you know, it's hard when you see somebody that's like 95 years old, like Nancy Reagan or somebody, needing protection. But um, if they kidnap her, it would not be, wouldn't be a good thing for the country. So it, it's, it's costly, it's very costly, because each one of those details has about 20, 25 people. Mm -hmm. And um, it's expensive. And so, and especially when they travel, and hotels and everything, it really gets expensive. So I, I think it's necessary. I'm not, I mean, I'm not going to sit tell you that I'm 100% in favor of it, but I think it's necessary. Boy, there's only a question for Peter Hanford. And for Ingrid, what, uh, can you share with us your decision to move to Kerrville? But all the places that you all been, how was Kerrville fortunate enough to, to <laughs> catch him? <laughs> okay, here's what happened. Uh, we had built our last home in California, in the Central Valley, in a town called Visalia, beautiful home. Um, 2000, we moved in, and somewhere around 2000, uh, 2002, something like that, I, I started to pass kidney stones. I didn't know what it was. I thought it was dying. So we went to our hospital. It was always on a weekend when this happened. I went to the hospital, and I sat there in a hard chair for four hours past the kidney stone while people came in by ambulance. Uh, from across the border, basically, a lot of them, and without health insurance. And I sat there past the kidney stone. And I thought, this is not good. So it happened again on a weekend, and uh, later on, and I told Ingrid at that time, when we talked about it, we just got to get out of here before we get any older. And so uh, our daughters live in San Antonio and had seen the parade of homes here in Kerrville, so we came and bought our lot that very same weekend. The, uh, the thing that impressed me when I first moved here. I went to the doctor. <clears throat> I went, I walked in the old hospital we had here, the emergency room. I walked in there because I had to see my cardiologist up on the whatever floor. We had to go through emergency early in the morning, look at him. And there was nobody in the emergency room. And I, I asked the nurse, I said, why? What, where's everybody? And they said, there's not been an accident on I-10 tonight. Yeah. And I said, I've arrived. <laughs> <laughs> And so that was one of the real important reasons the infrastructure out in California is degrading. And it's everything from the roads to the hospitals to schools to you name it. And um, I'm from there, my family's from there. And it was, uh, it was hard to leave, but not hard anymore. We go back once or twice a year and we see it in snapshots as it deteriorates. But um, that's, uh, our daughter was living in San Antonio. She said, come look at a lot, we did. And we're here, and they're in Oklahoma now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ms. Mark. I guess I'm just curious if, in your opinion, is there is there something the Secret Service should be doing today that they aren't, or is there something they're doing today that maybe you think they shouldn't be? Well, one of the things they shouldn't be doing is drinking down in South America and getting in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, I think probably today they're, they're very specialized today. They've got things down. They've got more money, especially now since they're in Homeland Security. When they moved out of Treasury, went into Homeland, they got a lot more money, a lot more people to call on. Because what we had to do when we were in Treasury Department, the whole time I was in the Secret Service, when we needed extra people for candidate details, we had to go to Customs or to ATF, other Treasury agents, try to use them. And they would get hard stress to help us. But now with, with Homeland Security, they got tons of people. 
to draw in for uh, what happens is in the Secret Service, the, the agents provide the inner perimeter, and then as you go out, another group of agents, agents that travel with the president, the agents that come in, and then the police are the last. So you have uh, a lot of people involved, but actually when I always felt pretty safe on the inside because we were, we were surrounded by a lot of people. But uh, anyway, I don't think they could be doing much, much more. I, I, I don't know what they could be doing. They do an awful lot, awful lot of stuff goes on, very expensive. Bill Clinton went to Paris once and wanted to stand on the balcony of a hotel. We had to take a, about a 12 by 12 bulletproof piece of glass that was that thick with, on wheels that we couldn't roll across tile because it would crack them. We had to park us down, took it up on like 12th floor, put it on his balcony so he could stand out there. He didn't go out there. <laughs> All right, that kind of stuff is very, very expensive. And they, um, as you probably have heard, the, the, Cer the Secret Service has had a lot of problems lately with, um, I guess, morale. Morale is probably not really good because they're working so many hours and a lot of it they're not getting paid for. The, um, what happened with, when I was in, and it ended a long time ago, we had uh, our forefathers that, in, in, in the time of William McKinley when he was assassinated about 1901, 1902, we took over protection of the, of the president and the White House grounds. So as time went on, our forefathers said, hey, these people that were working for the Metropolitan Police that were used to do this had a great retirement plan. So they said, let's take it. So we did. And it is a very, it's the best retirement plan in the government. There's none like it. Of course, it's been over with now for many, many years. And what the problem with it was, it was called the Golden Handcuff Retirement Plan. You could not leave the Secret Service and take it. So attrition rate was the lowest in the government. You couldn't go anywhere, you had to stay. Also, the supervisors took advantage of that because they knew you couldn't go anywhere. So they worked you uh, to death sometimes. Uh, and that ended in 1984. So the people that had 25 years in, somewhere around 2009, most of those people were gone. So now the new people there, they can take their retirement to any government agency and move it around. So when, they, when the going gets tough, like I've told you, it can. People are just leaving. And there's no loyalty anymore. We, we had kind of a forced loyalty. Uh, the, the retirement plan was uh, ended in 84. It's what was, it is one of the best still around. So that was, uh, that attributed to the uh, low morale that we have now. Because people just get tired and they leave after all that training. Any other? In the spirit of political correctness, would they allow a Muslim to be hired? Uh, we had, uh, I'm sure they do. The, uh, when I was there, we had uh, Africans from Africa that were, that were agents. Uh, I don't think we had a problem. It's a very touchy subject. Sure. Oh, and I'll tell you about females. Why didn't somebody ask me about that? 10% um, of the workforce are females. Listen now, 10%. 20% of the supervisors are female. Let that sink in. So we have a lot of female bosses. And the morale is still bad? Morale is bad. <laughs> Not for them. <laughs> How many are on the presidential detail? Not 300. Of the women? Oh, women. Well, I, I don't know. It's 10% of the workforce. I don't know how many. Probably, probably 20 or so, I don't know, I'm just guessing. When Clint was president, there were hundreds of women. He had a lot of kids. He also liked some of our agents. So anyway, I'll go ahead. Did you have a favorite presidential family? Yes. Reagan's. Ronald Reagan, by far. He was the most congenial. Uh, if you go back to the personalities, you know, Nixon was very cold and calculating. Uh, Jimmy Carter was nice, but I don't think he knew where he was much of the time. Um, Ford was obviously who he was. Uh, Clinton was a very, very nice man. <laughs> and uh, uh, the Bushes, um, okay, I guess. But Reagan is by far the best favorite. Were you involved when he got shot? No, I was in, Her I was in Pennsylvania, Harrisburg when he got shot. No, but I knew everybody there that was. Our agency was, was pretty small in those years. I knew everybody involved, but no, I wasn't there. 
Got another question. Yes. If the president were to come to Kerrville and you were still there and responsible for that trip, what kinds of things would you have to prepare for before he came? Oh my gosh. <laughs> It, it gets divided up into several, I mean, many, many different groups of people. You have people doing route surveys, uh, running routes, alternate routes, uh, hospitals, alternate hospitals, and not only just you're going through the hospital and checking all their what they have and what kind of blood they have, and everything. And also, if he's staying in a hotel, it really, really gets more because then you come in, you've got elevators that have to be checked out, and uh, just about everything that you can imagine possible has to. And um, I don't know how many different things, I can't even remember them all anymore, but it, it's just everything. Uh, the, uh, and of course then when you get to the event where he's going to be, you have to do the, the bomb searches, and then you gotta seal it up with agents. That's what takes a lot of our, our time. If, if he's at a big event, it might take the dogs, because you run the dogs through, it might take them hours to do that, and then you gotta seal it hours ahead of the, of, of the event. And uh, uh, let's see, command post, you have to have those set up everywhere so you have good radio communications. Would he eat the food prepared at the event? He would eat the food at the event if we have somebody watching and cooking at the event. New York usually, uh, there's White House chefs that travel with him that are, that, that are in the background with the cooks. Now when you get away from the president, vice president, candidates, they eat the same thing we do in Haiti. So once you get away from those two, it gets protection, you know, it goes down quite a bit as you cost. But yeah, the, uh, um, the, the White House chef watches everything that's eaten. And traveling abroad, they take everything. Yeah, everything goes. Yeah. Lloyd, it's been announced that President Trump is going to the Carolinas tomorrow. Yep. How does the Secret Service plan for a trip? Two days in advance, or one day in advance. <laughs> I can tell you this: they're working their hearts out because they are running down there. As soon as they got word of that, it may have been before we got word of it, but uh, they went. They sent teams of agents down there to start preparing. And if he just comes in and uh, makes one stop, it's not too bad. But if he goes around, then the motorcade routes have all going to be run, and you got flooded areas. You got all kinds of problems. But it is a horrendous amount of work. I have a friend of mine, actually it's a friend of our daughters, they're next door neighbors in DC. He's on the, he was on the detail. And he said he would, he's in he's out of the, he's in a field office now. But they're working around the clock in the field offices because they gotta support all this. So it's it's a lot of work. It's a ton of work. Do you think there's anything to the rumor that Trump's gonna have a uh, rally here at Tiger Stadium for Cruz? I think so. <laughs> I don't know. I'd love it if he did, but I don't think so. I don't know if he would have. Probably couldn't hold enough people. <laughs> Anybody else have any any questions at all? Really, I've got time. What kind of body armor did you wear? We had the Kevlar vest. And uh, in, in, when they first came out with them in the 80s, I guess, they had a small, medium, and large. You can imagine how that looked. You're so <coughs> like this, and, and uncomfortable, they're hot, but the newer ones are better. Uh, the uh, people assigned to protection are required to wear them. Now, part of the, a good part of the, uh, maybe 50-50, of the work is not protection work, it's investigating the threats on the president, and if you have time, counterfeiting of currency or whatever else might be going on with the financial crimes. But uh, yeah, they're required to wear them, and uh, even the, uh, the president has bulletproof overcoats. Sometimes you'll see them wearing it. Sometimes he looks pretty bulky, Probably because he's got a bulletproof vest on. But if you get a headshot, they don't have much good. You know, they have a, uh, showed some photos of a Secret Service with a fake arm. Is that, they said they had their hand <laughs> I saw that. I saw that. Was there anything hey, to it? I, I've never seen that, but that's a, that's a good idea. <laughs> but uh, if, you, if you're looking for agents when you're on television and you see the president, you'll see all the agents standing like this. That's what they're taught now. So if you see people standing around, they're agents like this with suits, suits on, so they can get to their gun real quick. That's the idea behind it. So just start watching for that, you'll laugh. <laughs> Wait, did you get a fair amount of weapons training? Oh yeah, I was a range master for a long time. And uh, 
Back then we had a, we carried a 357 Magnum, uh, Smith & Wesson, Smith & Wesson, and then the Uzi submachine gun, and the, uh, the Remington shotgun, which I really loved. You couldn't miss with a shotgun if you're nervous. You just shoot. Um, somebody asked President Trump to reopen the investigation on the Lindsay Graham case. Have you heard anything more about that? No, I have not heard of that at all. Absolutely. Say the question, question again. Um, somebody had asked President Trump to reopen the investigation on the liberty. Somebody who had served, I don't remember. I, I did, I, I, I'm not aware of it, but we've asked every president since okay. J, uh, LBJ going way back. But, you know, they don't seem to want to do that. So that who, was, killed, who killed Kenneth? Pardon me? Who killed John Kenneth? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not who you're told. I don't know. But uh, like you, I probably, I'm judging from your question. You have, you don't quite probably believe what you were told, and I'm, and I'm not sure I do either. But uh, when we were hired, we had to read the Warren report, and basically it's the standard stuff you see. And then before Warren died, he said it was it was not true; it was fabricated. And I'm, okay, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> um, earlier, I talked about having to. Um, there was a, someone that you were watching over that had to take a plane, and then but you had to, your, your detail had to go. John to Schmitz, park. yeah. Yes, and so at that time, you have a, you have a bubble on your car, too? Yeah, yeah, we did. Okay. Wait, I got one at home, I stole one. I have one now, the old fashioned back. Michael Kojak, you know, used to put his thing on his top of the <laughs> Yeah, we had those. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we did. And now today, <coughs> cars have them. You know, they're in the grills and everything, you don't see them. Oh. But yeah, we did, we did. And uh, the uh, Highway Patrol State Troopers were always very nice to us. Angela, they were very nice to us. Her husband's a state trooper. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we sped a lot and we didn't get in trouble, but yeah. Was the family allowed to say that you were a part of Secret Service or did they have to have a cover story? No, you know, they, they could say. Um, although I, I was, uh, my ID, my California driver's license said Lloyd D. Artist, because my name is Painter, Artist Painter. Oh, and, um, but that's, that's what we use when we, when, you know, if somebody went around and saw our driver's license. But, uh, yeah, the families could say that wasn't a big issue. I, I don't think anyway. Ingrid didn't have any protection in the baby. <laughs> she should have. And we lived, uh, we lived in, uh, we started in Sacramento, went to Westminster, California, went to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, actually, Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, Centerville, Virginia, which is Washington, D.C., back out to San Francisco, lived in Fairfield, California. So we were all over the place, moving. Yes, sir. Do your, do your neighbors know what you do, or do you? Have some other probably not so much. I didn't, it's kind of funny because when we worked, we didn't talk to neighbors very much. Basically, you know, it, it's kind of a strange thing because I, I had nothing in common with most people that worked in average jobs. I just didn't. And and we had a, a pretty good group of people in the service that we, you know, we had socialized with, but uh, I don't think the neighbors really knew too much, didn't say much. Oh yeah, the, uh, you were asked about the Lib USS Liberty earlier. There's been several television uh, specials done on it, and one of them, uh, all of them I was in, but I was interviewing a uh, real crazy person that we had to keep an eye on, and <coughs> I never told him my real name or anything, obviously, and one day I saw him and he said, you're Mr. Painter. Holy cow, how do you know that? He said, I saw you on television. So he had seen the, the uh, special on the USS Liberty and remembered it. He, he was really a crazy, crazy person. We had a lot of crazies. In fact, in, uh, in, in uh, Denver, one of my classmates, this was back in the 80s, was sitting in the office and a crazy came in and just shot and killed him. Mm -hmm. So uh, after that, we had a little bit of blast in our offices. And, yeah, they, uh, we attracted crazy people. And when you threaten the president, generally speaking, you're, most of them were mentally imbalanced. And we had to commit them into uh, the 70s, but probably, 
80%, 75% of my job was, was threats on the president. And I can't imagine what they're going through now. I can't imagine. I see threats on television. Right. Yeah. Is, is there an office in San Antonio that you can Yes. And there's an office in Austin. No. Not here. Right. This, is, this is coming out of San Antonio. I mean, there are several in Texas. Yeah, this, is, this, this area is under the uh, jurisdiction of San Antonio. Pretty big office. Well, medium size office. Is there any chance of your being called back if there's any? Uh, not out of my age, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. They really, they'd really be in trouble. But to, to back it up a little bit, um, in years past, they have called people up to work. Uh, not in recent years. They still right now use retired agents to do background investigations for, for hiring new people. They do that. But uh, there was one there was one occasion when they, they thought about doing that. They were so short-handed, but they never actually uh, went through with that. I don't think. But you know, I, at my age, I couldn't do much. Throw a gun at me. <laughs> Lloyd uh, and Ingrid, thank you so much. Thank you.